So something that was a little unusual in terms of my CNN program this weekend, I only get four segments per show, right? Opening commentary, leading into what we call the A block, then three other blocks that follow. If we shorten, if we shorten the blocks, we can squeeze five into a program. But in the typical CNN program of mine, I get four cracks at the apple. So there's a lot of competition for that real estate in terms of what will I be discussing on a particular day's program. And some, sometimes there's just such a breaking news story that you, you got to go with it. This was not that kind of weekend. But what was very unusual is that two of my four blocks both dealt with subject matter from my alma mater, at least for law school, the University of Pennsylvania. One of them was a Wharton story. We talked about it here on radio, but one of them was a a Wharton-based story where a professor asked her students how much they thought the average American earned, and then she reported via Twitter, we'd never know it if she hadn't commented on this, that 25% of them thought in excess of six figures. 25% thought in excess of six figures, and one student said, you know, 800,000, although we don't know if he or she were goofing or whether they were serious. So I wanted to talk about that, and I made that the focus of my opening commentary. I had things that I wanted to express on that. And then the second pen-related story, more applicable to my alma mater because it came from the law school, where a tenured law professor named Amy Wax, who has often caused controversy. I think she relishes causing controversy. Otherwise, why would she continue to do so? But now there's there's a full-on challenge by the law school's dean, Theodore Ted Ruger, uh, that challenges her tenure status. And, and so I talked about the Amy Wax situation and then had an academic from Princeton who came on to defend her right to say the controversial things that she has said. And one of the points that I made with him was that in the Philadelphia Inquirer coverage of Amy Wax, they've dispensed with any alleged. In other words, the the lead of their story, their coverage last week about Amy Wax posited whether her tenure status is in jeopardy because of her racist statements, not her alleged racist statements. So, uh, Professor Whittingham from Princeton, I, I was asking him, well, you know, do you recognize them as being racist? Therefore, I wanted to say to him, can a professor lose tenure for a racist statement? Because if the statements were racist, that's the issue that that then results. Um, l- let me frame this, TC, because you told me and by all means speak for yourself that of that of all the content on Saturday This is the one. A huge reaction online. Just an absolutely huge reaction. There was a lot to talk about on your CNN program. I mean, from COVID to salaries to, I mean, there were a lot of substance to talk about. This one had people from both sides, which I thought was really interesting because I thought it was going to be more straight across the board. She needs to go. Um, And I'd love to read a few to you just so you can see what people were saying. I want to hear them. Let me me frame it this way. The current dust-up with Amy Wax results from a December podcast that she did with a Brown University professor named Glenn Lowry. And it has been her repartee with Lowry that has caused controversy in the past. I'll get to that in a moment. But I have a transcript in front of me of of what was said. Wax says there is, um, let's call it danger of the dominance of an Asian elite in this country. And what does that mean? What is that going to mean to change the culture? And that's not a popular idea to say that like and then Lowry interrupts and says, well, what's the danger? What would be wrong with having a lot of Chinese or Indian or Korean engineers, physicians, computer scientists and whatnot running around here, creating value, enlivening the society? I mean, I don't see how we lose from that. How do we lose from that? And Amy Wax's response is to say, quote, well, does the spirit of liberty Beat in their breast, Glenn. That is my question. And then in written response to a listener of the podcast 
She further elaborated, as long as most Asians support Democrats and help to advance their positions, I think the United States is better off with fewer Asians and less Asian immigration. She had previously stirred controversy, and this is when she was on my radio program after what I'm about to tell you. And then she, I think, rather disingenuously acted as if she didn't know she was doing a live radio interview when clearly I think that was the case. She had previously stirred outrage because there was a September 2017 podcast called The Downside to Social Uplift. And she said this, here's an inconvenient fact, Glenn. I don't think I've ever seen a black student graduate in the top quarter of the class and rarely, rarely in the top half. She said that in the video which discussed affirmative action policies. I can think of one or two students who scored in the top half of my required first year course. She added that she based her opinion on the performance of her own students because, quote, a lot of this data is a closely guarded secret. When she said that at the time, Ted Ruger, the dean, fired back, said her claims were false. He told the student newspaper, black students have graduated in the top of the class at Penn Law. And contrary to any suggestion, otherwise black students at Penn Law are extremely successful, both inside and outside the classroom, in the job market and in their careers. Uh, There's more to it, but that gives you a, a, a flavor for, you know, what has landed her in hot water. But, you know, tenure is supposed to be this ongoing this permanence this protection that extends all the way to retirement and frees a faculty member who has tenure from any kind of concern over things that they've said any viewpoint that they've expressed okay so adele says and speaks for many when she says how could any black or asian student in her class expect to get fair treatment her censure is warranted right so she she was stripped of the ability to teach any of the mandatory core curriculum my understanding based on what's been published is that she's now teaching two uh relatively small elective courses so you don't have to take her class you don't have to take her yeah her but class. still who's now who's taking her class that's interesting right well tc my my thought is is a little different than that my thought is how does it feel to be a student of color at the Penn Law School, at my alma mater, because Amy Wax has told the world, none of you do well there. Or what if I'm a graduate? You know, what if I'm applying for a job? What if, I, what if I'm a black graduate of Penn Law and I already have a job somewhere in a law firm, private? Like, she's just trumpeted to the world that I was not a, a high achiever. And according to the dean, she has falsely said so see i think there are a couple of issues here relative to her one is her essential condemnation of the academic prowess of black students second this whole question of whether asians have liberty beating in their heart but there's also there's also a grade confidentiality aspect of this and if you remember when she was a guest of mine here on this program her end of the conversation went stone cold silent when I asked her whether she'd violated grade confidentiality because no faculty member can speak openly of the grades of his or her students when she said what she said about black students it seemed to me she'd violated the confidentiality that applied to all students of color. Yeah, that's when she protested that she didn't know she was on a live radio show, demanded to see the email. I'm sure she found the email because she was clicking around and then didn't and then didn't say anything else. And you read aloud on live radio. I had it right in front of me. The invitation, which made clear we, we, yeah. we'd like live to conduct on air. A, a live right radio interview with you. Uh, Chef Michael says these days public outcry is not a reliable measure of truth. A judicial process must be in place to examine the evidence before passing judgment. Well, it's really convoluted. It's really vague because, first of all, here's what the Penn Faculty Handbook says about tenure. A system of tenure for faculty members is the preeminent means of fostering and protecting academic freedom of the faculty in teaching and in scholarly inquiry. And the only reasons that it would ever end before retirement are resignation, death, or by action of the trustees under the provisions for removal for just cause or by reason of financial exigency. Okay, so what is just cause? Like you got to go through this whole. What is it? 
a major infraction of university behavioral standards, an action involving flagrant disregard of the standards, rules, or missions of mission of the university, or for the customs of scholarly communities. So what are the standards, rules, and missions? Pretty got, broad. We need another layer. I know. Okay, so now I peel the onion one step further. They say, well, here's a list. It's not a complete list. It ranges from plagiarism to misusing university funds to harassing a member of the university community to sexual assault, rape, and murder. Oh, jeez. So what compelled Penn to think that they have grounds here for some type of disciplinary remedy against Amy Wax, Ted Ruger, the dean, said that her words warranted an elaborate university hearing process that could result in anything from salary reduction to suspension or termination. In a statement, he said, quote, her conduct has generated multiple complaints from members of our community, citing the impact of pervasive and recurring vitriol and promotion of white supremacy as cumulative and increasing. These complaints clearly call for a process that can fairly consider claims, for example, that her conduct is having an adverse and discernible impact on her teaching and classroom activities. And then I had Keith Whittingham, uh, Whittington, pardon me, Keith Whittington, a professor of politics at Princeton. He chairs a group that calls themselves the Academic Committee, um, pardon me, the Academic Freedom Alliance, which sent out a letter to the university and defended Wax's ability to voice those views. Two more tweets that are very yeah. interesting. Red um, Redwords 126 says, an academian should not ever lose their job because they think differently. That's what makes us grow. Uh, with okay, Well, at least this person's a purist because this person like, said not ever. never. Not ever. Right. And finally, M. Nula says, there is no free pass for academia who indulge in outright racism. The end. It'll be very interesting because of this vague standard. I'm not sure where it all ends up. I'll say one other thing. Uh, the letter from Professor Whittington at Princeton cited the American Association of University Professors. Quote, as the AAUP has emphasized, the controlling principle is that a faculty member's expression of opinion as a citizen cannot constitute grounds for dismissal unless it clearly demonstrates the faculty member's unfitness for the position. So here's how I look at it. Is Amy Wax, by definition, unfit when she questions whether all Asians have the spirit of liberty beating in their chest? Is she unfit when she says, when she, even if true, reveals that she's never had a black student in the top of the class, Penn Law says that's just not true. So maybe it's maybe it's as simple or as complicated as uh, unfitness and how you define it. It'll be a very interesting case to to see how it plays out and what conclusion it reaches. Yeah.